Jill, whenever you're ready, you can just proceed. Great. Thank you very much. So um, it's great to be here again, and I want to introduce the team that is here. Uh, Robin Albus, I, I don't know if you've all met her yet, but she is our chief financial officer on week three. So, uh, she'll uh, certainly get a great orientation today. And with me is uh, Stephanie Bro, and I know you know Stephanie as our director of finance, and she'll be co-presenting, and we have uh, lots of folks here that can actually answer um, the questions. Uh, Jonathan Billings is also here um, in the audience. He's the vice president of community relations and RISE Vermont. Uh, Dina Orfanidis is a new face to us as well. Dina uh, is our chief nursing officer and joined us in January. Amy Putnam is here. She is our vice, vice president of physician services. Uh, Devin Batchelder, who's behind me, is decision support and budget manager. Uh, Dr. Gregory Grophy um, is also here. He is the executive medical director for our physician services. Uh, Joanne Manahan is in the audience. She is our manager of our emergency department along with Paula Sword. She is the director of our primary care uh, and pediatrics practice um, and just recently joined us. And also with us, uh, taking a great time and effort to get here, is our board chair, Leanne Berthume. So grateful to have um, Leanne here. Oh, Nick Haddon. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I was looking for you. No, Nick Haddon, um, who's also on our board as well. So thank you all for joining us. So I want to start off by really talking about um, you know, the pride that I have in, in sitting here, the pride, the determination. And I must admit, uh, last year when I presented, if you remember the, the Claude Van Damme picture, um, it was really uh, my picture split between um, two of these big trucks. You know what, and now I sit here before you and want to know that that split is actually really painful. And we're feeling it um, in our organization, and we'll talk about that. But the hope that I have with this amazing team to continue forward, to pave, to lead our commitment is endless um, on this journey. So with that, you know, we are nationally recognized. You know, we're proud of the things that we're accomplishing. We also know inside the organization um, that we're working extremely hard um, to be lean. Um, to be ready for this future, and we're proud of those moves as well, but it's hard and it's challenging um, as we move forward. We're courageous in so many ways. So we're balancing the care that you've heard a lot about in the, in the previous um, groups. We're taking on risk. At the same time, we have the same story of trying to ensure access, that recruitment and retention. Investing in the future of population health, which is really where we all need to be going, and we can't do it without partnering um, in this transformation. Inside our organization, no more silos, across our community, all for one, and for this, the care of our community, and regionally and across the state. With all of that, you know, we're suffering. Um, our bottom line is challenging us. This is the third year. Um, that we're here um, talking about our bottom line. The environment is complex, and really it's about aligning our priorities um, and our incentives across our system, um, in our community, and also across the state. And I hope that we can do those things even in differently um, as well. Oops, make sure, there we go. So hospital issues, you wanted us to talk about those and um, the wage pressures and the medical inflation is certainly going above the cap, um, five and a half to six percent on the medical inflation. So it's certainly hard to manage those expenses under their, their revenue cap. Recruitment and retention, um, as you've heard from many, uh, you know, keeping top talent uh, in this time of shortage and uncertainty, people are questioning us differently about what we're gonna look like going forward in the future um, and how we're going to actually even pay physicians in the future and as we move towards capitation. So certainly we wanna make sure that we're hiring the top talent, but folks that are, are leaning in to help us try to figure out this future because it's clearly not the same. When we think about um, you know, recruitment and retention of top talent, it's so powerful to over-communicate what's going on. So folks, 
understand how the care, the service that they're providing is being so impactful in keeping the care local um, in our community. As I had a CEO roundtable um, just earlier this week to describe the changes that we've just done over the past uh, couple of weeks, we've reduced some staff. One is too many. We did this in March. Numbers aren't high, but again, one is too many. To be a CEO that can say that you're not going to have any layoffs is a powerful statement. And it's disappointing. I have not been able to live by that statement. It's coming too fast um, at us, and the challenges are great. At the same time, as I describe to staff, I try to answer their fears with clarity um, and, and heart. I'm talking about why are we investing in something like Congress in Maine, a building on Main Street of St. Albans. It is about recruiting and retaining. It's about education. It's about um, having 20 more, uh, 27 more graduates of nursing in St. Albans that can fill our fast turnover. Um, I know Joanne Mannion's in this audience, and she's been here 44 years as a registered nurse. The nurses that are going to school now are staying about 18 months to two years because there's other things they can do. How do we get them engaged and continuing on with us? The pace of change um, is exhausting um, our staff, not only how we think through innovatively going forward, but as I sit here, four very complex, behaviorally challenged patients in our emergency department waiting placement. And the patient on the progressive care unit on our inpatient that we almost can't get close enough to, four assaults on our staff to try to manage the pressure ulcer on his heel. This is really what's going on. And then the, the uh, medical record. You would think it would be so cool to integrate the medical record, and it is. People talking to each other across the system. Our ED saying, isn't it fantastic that they now can talk to primary care and understand as a patient comes into the emergency department what their care has been in the community. They're saying thank you. On the other side, our primary care and pediatricians in particular are so exhausted and strained by this electronic health record that we're needing to plow in additional resources. We're losing revenues, decreasing access, and the dissatisfaction of our providers is indescribable. Aging facilities, I know you're going to be reviewing a CON for us with our emergency department that tells that story. Our aging population, it's bulging, as certainly as they come through with chronic condition. We're managing that. We're also in that Congress in Maine building besides a sim lab and nursing students having lifestyle changes, a demonstration kitchen, working with the food shelf and Martha's Kitchen, helping people to use fresh products and understand how to cook in their homes, reducing and preventing chronic condition. The community case management that's going on. I know uh, Laurel talked about the quadrants and how many people are in the quadrants of quadrant four, we happen to have more percent-wise than anyone else, and we are wrapping around it as a community. And prevention, the 46-year-old that just last week was in our health coaching setting, who weighed 350 pounds, in tears. Thank you for helping get my life back and my job. So ensuring access through employment of physicians. You know, it is building expense, and it looks like our costs are rising, but it's really about investing in the right access for our community. So everything goes around our community health needs assessment, mental health, addiction, obesity, suicide. You will see the list there. It used to be about primary care access and specialty care access. Now it's a list of behavioral issues. And through our unified community collaborative and our accountable community health work for our entire community coming together to solve this, the social determinants of health, learning collaboratives that bring our community together. And surgical optimization, as we think about lifestyle medicine and changing outcomes for folks. And thinking about if someone is going into surgery now, our surgeons are referring them to lifestyle medicine if it's obviously an elective. And we're able to improve their health outcomes before surgery so when they go home, 
maybe home is now a reality because they used to go to skilled care and we're avoiding that cost now because we're doing prehabilitation. So they're more ready and they're stronger when they go home. And Dr. Royer talking to Dr. Fontaine in a medical staff meeting and said, I sent a patient to you who needed surgery. And Dr. Fontaine knew that patient. And Dr. Royer said, that patient no longer needed surgery because of your intervention, reducing cost. The for-profit ambulatory surgery uh, center. We have experienced the loss of a surgeon um, with that center. In fact, most all of our surgeries are outpatient because of the way we're managing and preparing patients and staying with best practice. What will that mean for us and our surgical program? The 30% capitation to 70%, we're now going two years of the second 30% to 70%. Um, the 30%, what is the path forward um, to get to 70% is certainly something that worries us. And then the revenue cap, and then making sure we have the necessary future capital. Collaborating across our organization, across the state, collaborating with a healthcare advocate. And we're glad that we have a meeting with you later this fall to really understand and to be better at how we handle our free care. Partnerships um, within our community. Thinking about this umbrella organization as we work with our board and leaders of other organizations, such as home health and mental health and our FQHC, what ways can we partner together, align as we get prepared for a capitated environment? That alignment is important as we care for the attributed lives together and understand where's the right care, the right place for that patient. And I'm happy to tell you that we're partnering with the Howard Center as well with our addiction program and how we can actually co-locate co those programs even with NCSS, our designated agency, so the door that folks walk in that need this care are going in the right door with wraparound services, working in partnership together in the same space. Partnering with One Care Vermont, partnering with UVM Medical Center um, on care, with telehealth, with endocrinology, and other services that need to be provided locally for that wellness and prevention. And the Working Bridges Program for the United Way, our newly formed partnership. <clears throat> so we are redefining our future. We can no longer just cut our way through this. We're working with our board, our medical staff leaders, and our management teams with input from our staff and our community on what is the direction forward. This is going to take us answering questions of what do we invest in, what do we maintain, what do we change. If we've only had two ICU patients in the past week and the week before, do we continue with an ICU? that we've always known. We're grappling with that. Should we have telehealth? Are there patients that should be paused there in our hospital to provide that right care? You know, can we have intensivists through telehealth help our patients stay local? Because we know if they have their families around them, then their health and their recovery will be improved. We have to grapple with that in the very short weeks ahead. Advancing te uh, technology, we've tried telehealth with occupational health, with endocrinology, and others were on a path forward with that. And note that we have a violation of our bond covenant related to our debt service coverage ratio. Yes, a lot due to our Meditech circumstance I'll describe in a moment, but also the use of locums and providers to keep our, our services um, available. You, as a result, have received a revised budget that was submitted. We had submitted a 1% of, uh, modest operating margin as we have definitely had been our losing margins. And, and with this revised budget, it is a minus 0.2% margin. You'll hear more about that. So it's alignment. It's alignment across our organization, across our community, across the Green Mountain Care Board, our legislators, our payers, and the healthcare providers. For all of Vermonters, this collective impact that we're all shooting for and having the budgetary latitude because we are fueling and funding the future with hospitals, and we need to be able to do that to continue this journey. And then there's Rise Vermont, and balancing the chaos with the hope of the future. 
and what we want for every community as you think about primary care and being the blueprint, the center of the healthcare delivery system, we think of Rise Vermont and lifestyle medicine and health coaching is the means as they go out and do their work, their school, living in their communities, what is that community like? Is it embracing these changes that they need to make as individuals? We will be doing our second round of measurement studies in our schools this fall. And the Maple Run School, transformational policy development in their school that is moving their WellSat score from 33% to 82%. It really revolutionized a wellness policy in the school system, and I wish that for every school system across the state. I watched them grapple personally as parents and board members about where we go with wellness. And the bottom one, this is a busy slide for you to review, but the bottom one was Blue Cross Blue Shield, we're self-insured as you know, showing up and telling us as our administrator, there's something different going on with your employees. Yes, we do have some high cost outliers, but what they found is that those that are, are using our health coaching, we allow health coaching for all of our employees and their spouse, but those that are using health coaching, there is a lower cost per person in the medical care of over $3,200. But you know what? We don't get paid for it. As we expand that out into our community and what's right for the gentleman who's 49 and 350 pounds, how does he pay for that? We're becoming frightened with our investment in population health. All right, now we can cover some really fun numbers and things. Thank you, Jill, and uh, thank you all for having us here today. Um, you asked us to speak about our net patient revenue and fixed prospective payment budget, and I've heard um, some board dialogue and questions really trying to understand how organizations go about putting their budget together um, and how we come up with the rate increase request that we have for you all. So I want to just walk you through this simple table that we have here. Um, where we always start is with our current year budget. Uh, so for us, you can see that number of, you know, almost 113 million. And from there, we needed to address a dermatology practice that was a physician transfer out of our system. So this is a physician transfer that's really going in the opposite direction of what you're used to seeing. Um, that practice was hospital owned and has become independent and is still in our community, um, but we needed to take that out. And so that really gives us our base um, or our starting point when we work towards putting a budget together for FY20. And the first thing that we do every year um, is we sit with our managers and our directors, our leadership team, and our providers and of all of our revenue generating departments and we look at trends. Um, we talk to them about volume and utilization to see what their thoughts are. Um, we talk about providers that we know are coming and going. And then we take a look at reimbursement from our payers and what we know is happening in that space. So we read the proposed rule for Medicare. We look at um, Medicaid and our dish payments. We also talk to OneCare and figure out what our assumptions are going to be um, related to the number of attributed lives and the percent of our population that will be under a capitated payment program. And then we say, where are we in relationship to the cap um, that you have all established and provided your guidance with? And that helps shape our rate increase request. So what we have is a 5.9% rate increase request, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, because we uh, are putting together and submitting a budget, even with, our, even with our revised budget that has us at that cap, we are not exceeding it. And then you have here listed a, a primary care transfer into our system. Um, so that is uh, separate and outside of the cap. And again, we can talk about that um, a little bit more later on in this presentation, but that's the number second from bottom. Um, and that gets us to our total FY20 uh, net patient revenue. So to talk a little bit more about the 5.9%, because I've also heard discussion and questions around how do we implement that. And for NMC, we really have two components uh, to our rate increase request. 
So the first component is a 7.63% increase on our hospital-based services. And the second piece to that is a 0% increase in our physician professional services. And we're doing that very intentionally. Um, we feel it is important for a visit to a primary care physician or a visit, a visit to our addiction services uh, clinic, for example, to remain the same. We want those to remain flat um, because we feel those are really the services that Vermonters need the most and we feel it aligns with healthcare reform and really providing the right care in the right setting. The last thing I wanna mention is that we will not be applying our rate increase differently across payers. Um, so you all know that we won't see the benefit of that rate increase from our government payers, but we have not established one rate increase for you know, Medicare and Medicaid and then a separate rate increase for you know, Blue Cross or MVP, for example. So it is the same across all payers. We want to get into some key metrics um, with you all. And so this slide has a couple key metrics on it. It talks about, again, net patient revenue, as we just covered. And that is the blue uh, bar. And we also talk about operating margin on this same graph as well. And so that is the yellow line. So what you can see um, is that historically, NMC's net patient revenue has met or exceeded our budget in most years, right up until uh, about 2018, actually. In 2019, we are not projecting that we will hit our net patient revenue budget, but it is very important, I can't stress it enough, um, how nearly all of that variance is related to the time period after May 1st, which is when we implemented our Meditech ambulatory system. And we've seen um, some challenges and, and certainly some revenue impact as a result of that. So this is an issue that uh, we know is temporary um, and we also are working, I would say it's our top priority in our organization, we're working closely with Meditech, with our providers and with our staff to get those system issues sorted out so that we can get volumes and therefore revenues back on track and really back to a normal uh, state for NMC. If you were to look at our net patient revenue through the first seven months of our fiscal year, so the uh, information we would have submitted to you all that went through April 30th, you would have seen our net patient revenue be very, very close to what we had budgeted in the current year. The operating margin on this graph is very concerning. It's concerning for us, and I know it's concerning for you all as well. Um, you can see the trend, and you can see what has happened to our operating margin since the rate overcorrection in 2016. We are going to talk a lot about expenses because we understand that expenses are a driver of our overall financial performance and of our operating margins. And so we're gonna get into that in great detail. But this trend is concerning and what we know uh, is that hospitals cannot survive in the long term uh, with negative operating margins. We all know it's, it's really a two to 3% positive operating margin that is needed to be financially stable um, and to continue to invest in the organization. The next uh, metric we have here is days cash on hand. Um, so for several years, uh, NMC would come and have the conversation with you all about days cash on hand and how it was increasing. And the conversation back at that time was that NMC was intentionally building up cash reserves in order to do some very large but very strategic um, and appropriate capital investment. So every uh, organization in Vermont is at a different place when it comes to its capital needs. And what is its age of plant and how long has it been since it has been a major renovation. Um, and so we had positioned ourselves for that and committed to you that we would execute on a master facility plan that was largely paid for by our cash reserves, um, as well as some other large capital projects as well. And that's exactly what we have done. 
Um, and it's exactly what we plan to continue to do in fiscal year 20. And so we're going to talk about that some more when we talk about capital towards the end of the presentation. Um, you can see that for fiscal year 20, and we provided a, a projection for fiscal year 21 as well, that we will drop below the S&P benchmark um, for days cash on hand for an A-rated hospital. Our strong balance sheet and our, and our strong amount of cash has not only allowed us to invest in capital, we talk a lot about capital when we talk about cash, but really it is also what has allowed us uh, to weather the storm for these last three years. And with our revised budget that we have would be a fourth consecutive year of having a negative margin. Um, it has allowed us to sustain those losses and still keep the momentum of investing in access um, and in this transformation of the healthcare delivery system. And I just want to note at the bottom here that these figures do include our ED modernization project certificate of need. So they may vary from what you have because as we prepare our budget, we don't uh, include CONs that are not yet approved. Um, but I wanted to show for illustration purposes here today with that included in the project, which is 7.6 million. Okay, so here's where we're really going to talk um, about expenses in our organization and the drivers behind our expense growth, because we realize that we have expense growth. There is, there is no denying that um, at NMC. And so here's a breakdown to help us better understand what's happening in our organization from an expense standpoint. So we've broken it down between kind of the, the base hospital operations and all of our outpatient physician practices. So. When we talk about physician transfers, um, we often talk about that as a revenue item, right? It's a revenue item that is excluded from the cap, um, but what we don't often talk about is the expense component of those physician transfers. So if you're acquiring a practice, you not only get to acquire their revenues, but also their expenses. And so when we look at our expense growth, it is fully loaded with all of those physician transfers, and that's been really significant um, for NMC. So over the past you know, five to seven years, you all have seen us request and have approved physician transfers um, related to primary care on multiple occasions, um, chronic pain and addiction services, also pediatrics was a big one for us a few years ago, uh, urgent care, and then other things that um, are considered you know, staples, smaller services, but still staples and important uh, points of access for our community like dermatology, uh, ENT, general surgery, and the list goes on. So again, many of these things needed to be stabilized um, in order to address the top priorities in our community health needs assessments. And these are services that we truly feel are appropriate to be done at a community hospital. And so when we look at our growth and expenses, we truly feel like it's not a story of expense mismanagement, but really a story about investment. Meanwhile, our hospital expenses, that's the dark blue area, are growing at an average rate of 4.3%. Uh, we've talked to you about the challenges with inflation and wage pressures, and I know you've heard that story from our peers as well. Um, and I also want to point out that that 4.3% includes the over $1 million of, you know, I'll call it budget reconsideration funds that you approved for us back in 2016. And we use that money uh, to fund Rise Vermont and to address social determinants, and those are things that we continue to fund today. We know that every organization has an opportunity to reduce expenses, and so we're going to talk about that as well, because expense reduction and our operational improvement plan is something that we are taking very seriously um, at Northwestern, and I know Jill's going to cover that shortly. So I want to show you this graph as well, which kind of speaks to cost, but looks at it in terms of cost to the system. So this isn't just NMC expenses, this is cost to the healthcare system. And I know that you all have seen this graph before. And when you look at the health service area for St. Albans, you see us in that lower left quadrant. So this means that cost to the system is low and utilization is low. 
So we are not providing expensive services and we are not providing services in excess. To me, this, uh, this uh, slide uh, really tells the story of we certainly have costs growing, but they're growing in the right areas and we're resulting in financial losses. So with this lower utilization, when you think about capitation, and so we're at 30% capitated right now, but when you think when you lower utilization, that 30% of their savings in there, if they're saving, then how is that offsetting um, the thief of service world? And right now that is still 70%. It worries us, worries me about the 70% and getting to that over the next two to three years of capitation because again, if we're all kind of doing the right thing and moving our attributed lives and making that uh, much larger, uh, then it, what is the right amount of capitation to allow the savings to offset the remaining fee for service? In our calculations, it's closer to 80%. So this 30% that we're held to now for, for two years, we almost want to celebrate because we're on this journey of capitation, but right now it is really quite painful uh, because we need much more of that in order to get where we want to go in this transformation and to make the finances um, work. So we're working hard to balance that and you can see that we're investing in the right things because it puts us in this lower quadrant. Um, but that doesn't translate in our financial sustainability. And, and so that's what worries us. At the same time, we're committed to it. So this whole painful thing that I talked about at the very beginning we're leading, and we want to lead and continue to lead, but it's painful, and it's leading us to make some more challenging decisions that, as we talk about expense reduction momentarily, we need to look at bigger things like program and services at this point. And before we leave this slide, I just want to speak to uh, total cost of care, because that was something you all asked us to speak to as well, and I know you have kind of a separate page document from us on that. Um, so the St. Albans Health Service area has a spending level that is below the state average and it is actually below the 3.5% um, goal of you all. So if you look at it uh, over the past five years, it is at 3.4% and it is actually slowing. So if you look at it over the past three years, it's actually at 2.5%. So how does all of that shape up um, and translate into a P&L and a balance sheet for NFC for FY20? So I, wanted, I want you to please know that these are the revised budget figures, um, what you see in front of you. So we have um, the challenging issue of our Meditech ambulatory system and we have not uh, changed our revenue budget at this time. Again, we know that is probably the biggest area of risk in this budget for FY20. If you were asking me the thing that keeps me up at night, it would be that. We know October 1 is quickly approaching. Um, and we have, however, added um, $1.5 million in expenses related to the Meditech ambulatory project to this budget because we just, we know that they're not avoidable and that they needed to be added at this time. And Jill's gonna get into some detail about what that $1.5 million is. And so that results in a uh, negative margin for FY20 for NMC of negative 0.2%. And I have not separately listed out on this slide the revenue deductions piece of our PL, but I do want to spend a minute talking about it um, and specifically talking about bad debt and free care. Um, as Jill mentioned, we're very excited um, to work with the healthcare advocate because we do not have a favorable ratio of free care write offs to bad debt write offs. And we want to do everything we can to improve that. Um, it's not intentional, and so if there are things that we can learn from our peers. I know now we need to talk to Northeastern. Um, so if there are things we can be doing, we absolutely want to be doing them. I think every organization would agree um, that we would rather write off a dollar to free care than write off a dollar to bad debt. Um, and so we absolutely want to work on that. And on the balance sheet side, I just want to spend a minute talking about risk reserves because, again, it has been a topic of conversation. So what I'm showing here for FY20 is a risk reserve on our balance sheet related to our participation in OneCare of nearly $3 million. 
That is actually the same amount that I anticipate having on my balance sheet for the end of this fiscal year, what I sit with today. And so I do not anticipate a P&L impact related to risk reserve between FY19 and FY20. If we are, if one care is successful um, in increasing the number of attributed lives and the, the overall amount of our population um, that falls under the capitated program, we will have to take a look at that. Um, but there just wasn't anything imminent um, in our conversations at one care at this point for us to move that amount. And we, like everyone, have to work with our auditors to make sure that they're comfortable and feel that our reserves are appropriate. And NMC's um, strategy is to reserve risk at 75% of the maximum allowable risk. So we are not reserving at 100%, and we do not have multiple years um, of risk reserve on our books either. 2018 is not quite settled, but I do not have multiple years of risk. This is our cash flow statement uh, for fiscal year 20. And the thing to really talk about and to note on this is the amount of cash reserves. We talked about it before when we talked about a day's cash on hand that we will continue to use to fund capital investment. So we do plan on spending more on capital than cash that we will generate in FY20. And you know, this is one of those areas where I know you just heard the same thing this morning. They look at it on a monthly basis and reprioritize it because capital spend and capital investment is an area where organizations have some, some higher discretion or flexibility. So if we were to find ourselves not meeting our budget for FY20, this is an area where we could look. This is a lever um, that we can pull if needed. Now we're going to talk um, a little bit about um, our cost drivers and cost containment. Um, Stephanie had just mentioned about the Meditech and the implications. We are on Meditech for our inpatient, um, also our emergency department, and we recently on May 1st transitioned to have a fully integrated system to our ambulatory practices on May 1st. There was a lot of work. It was two years almost in the build and working with Meditech and testing with providers and staff. That being said, um, it has been a very challenging go live uh, with the system for moving from a best of breed system to an integrated system. It certainly has some functionality uh, that um, is, is missing uh, from the previous. So we have a product functionality, we have scope and we have workflow. There's like three different buckets. So with that, and I'm just speaking with the CEO of Meditech yesterday and will be um, um, weekly in regards to what are the absolute deliverables because we need them leaning all in and this is one of the places of exhaustion of, of our staff and our providers. Our providers want to see patients and they don't want a barrier in between seeing a patient and communicating with a patient but making sure the documentation is complete. We all believe in integration but it is a little bit more challenging um, than we might think. So we've talked about um, uh, our, our staff and needing more resources, um, also coding staff. It takes more time um, to do this work, um, information technology support, and also interfaces and licenses and others, about 1.5 million. We're hoping we don't have to realize all of that, um, but right now it is our best projection um, because of the complications we've experienced and the challenges to get a system like this um, to new code, so to speak, um, and new functionality. I'm really worried about the risk of losing providers as I sit here today, but I will tell you as we put a path to go back to the previous system and the path forward, they're equally complex um, around the quality and safety of patient care, which we all stand for. And this is a difficult, I think it's been the difficult, most difficult uh, situation for me to, to really work through um, as a CEO um, in making sure the care is safe and the practitioners have the tools in which to do their job in a safe and fulfilling manner. So cost. We've um, experienced um, certainly uh, some changes in our financial situation. Um, here is an overview of the cost reductions. If we had added up, it's about six million. 
Um, we have more work to do on the program and service lines. Um, this has impacted people, uh, mostly uh, through attrition is how we try to do our work and try to do it proactively. We've offered voluntary exit programs, so we've tried to um, you know, encourage and reward people for their, their service. We've certainly looked at maximizing um, our, our captures, our charge captures, our, our revenue as appropriate with our 340B. We looked at every contract and we have through our implants certainly negotiated um, a change that has resulted in over $350,000. You can see the list there. We look at overtime, we look at different costs, we look at policies, how we're paying our staff, how we're recruiting our overtime. <coughs> And ultimately, there's still more work to be done. So with all of that, it's incredibly easy for me to reconcile the current year for you, right? Um, <laughs> we are trying to be as transparent as possible with you all, and we really appreciate um, you and your staff being flexible with us and working with us because this is a first for us that we have such a significant um, issue going on that is negatively impacting our financials, and it's happening at the same time as this process. Um, so with that said, it has, been, it has been very challenging and very difficult, um, but we know that we will have at least um, a $9.5 million variance from what we budgeted for a net operating margin and where we will actually end the current year. And so we've tried to break down that variance for you into a few buckets, and then I can discuss you know, whether we have or have not addressed that in our budget for fiscal year 20. So the first of which is, again, the Meditech ambulatory issue. Um, so this is a net patient revenue issue, and we estimate it to be worth at least uh, $3.3 .3 million of revenue variance in the current year. Um, and once again, we have added additional expenses to our budget for next year, but have not changed our net patient revenue. For self-insured health claims, that's an expense item, and we estimate the variance in that area of our expenses in the current year to be 1.7 million. So Jill mentioned that we have recognized savings for our um, healthier individuals who are working with health coaching or any individual who's working with health coaching. What we have also seen, uh, unfortunately, is a few high cost claims. Um, it often doesn't take many of them and we have a handful um, in the current year. So we, have, we do have stop loss insurance, um, as everybody does, but until it reaches that level, Northwestern has to pay for those claims. And so we have increased our health insurance claims budget from the current year to FY20 based on what we're seeing. Um, we were seeing this early in the year, and so when it came time to put our budget together, we have increased it in that area. We also had um, a surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, who was out on an unexpected FMLA earlier in our fiscal year. Um, and I think you've heard uh, people speak to how in a small community hospital, even when one or two providers uh, leaves, it can have a really significant impact. So we all know that um, these surgeons are generating ancillary services as well, whether it's imaging um, or the surgeries that they're doing in the OR. And so this particular surgeon generates the most um, patient revenue for Northwestern and was out unexpectedly, and we have estimated that to be 1.2 million um, and have not built anything into next year's budget for that as he has returned. Um, and then Jill mentioned earlier as well, we have some locum position um, cost in order to preserve access and to keep our services available to the community, um, some interim management and consulting expenses. So that's a little bit of a mix. Some of those things that we know are over and done with have not been built into the budget for next year, but some of them have. Now we're going to talk a little bit about capital. Um, so I'll start with our CON projects. So NMC recently closed uh, the CON for our medical office building, and we anticipate closing the CON for our private inpatient rooms and our medical clinic space in November of this year. Um, we have been granted expedited review for an emergency department modernization project, um, so that one is listed here as well with a cost of $7.6 million. 
Our non-CON capital plans include uh, routine replacements of equipment for nearly $5 million. And then we listed out for you what we call the strategic investment um, section of our capital budget. So we, have, we do break it into two categories, routine replacements and strategic investments. And these are the strategic investments that we are um, pursuing in FY20. So again, the emergency department renovation, it will actually cross two years. So the amount you see here is the amount that we expect to spend in fiscal year 20 related to that project. Um, and that will update a space that has not been renovated in nearly 30 years um, and has several benefits, but arguably the biggest benefit is allowing us to more safely care for these really challenging behavioral health patients that Jill mentioned before, we currently have four of them. Uh, Co-locating uh, addiction services with our community partners to create a center of hope and recovery. Um, like Jill said, when somebody can walk through uh, any door and receive the services that they need, that's absolutely our goal. And then leasing space uh, in the new building in downtown St. Albans to do that nursing program um, that we spoke about earlier as well and to have the wellness classes in the demonstration kitchen. We've asked for a long-range financial outlook, and so we have uh, put a five-year projection together here, but really the most important part of this is the statement that we have made at the bottom. This is what it looks like for NMC if we were to do nothing. Uh, and we are not a do-nothing organization. So we know that we have to uh, look at programs and services we need to work with our board, we need to work with our uh, community partners and our medical leaders um, and figure out what we are going to do to really be financially um, sustainable and to be relevant in the future. Okay, historical compliance with budget orders. Um, before we get into the slide, I would like to just speak directly to the last five years of compliance. Um, in 2015, NMC was over the NAP patient revenue cap, and that was resolved with our 8% rate reduction in 2016. In 2016, we were also over the cap, and that was resolved by a reduction in our rate increase request for 2017. In 2017, we were compliant, um, just slightly under NAP patient revenue. Uh, pretty much right on budget. In 2018, we were under our net patient revenue by 2.6%, but we're not rebased, so we're thankful for that. Um, and in 2018, we were uh, very much on track to meet our net patient revenue budget until uh, May 1st, and so at this point, we do not anticipate that we will meet our net patient revenue budget. So we feel it's really important when we talk about um, budget compliance to talk about the history of rate increases. So what we have here is a graph that shows the median rate increase for all the Vermont hospitals. That's in the blue line on this graph. And Northwestern Medical Center's rate increases are in the black line. And the gray, it's, it's tough to see here, um, but there is a gray shaded area that shows the lowest and the highest approved rate increase in any of those years as well. And you can see by looking at this that for eight out of the last 10 years, NMC has been at or below the median and oftentimes the lowest rate increase. And you must be curious about the red dots. I am. <laughs> So the red dot, which is uh, at the closer to the top, but not the top of the gray shaded area. So with that 5.9% rate increase, it gets us to a minus 0.2% margin. Our original um, submission had us at a 1% margin. And what we would need to have the modest 1% margin again is that red dot, which is 8.55%. The red dot, that's the top red dot. The one in the middle that's right above uh, the black dot, which is us in two places. One is uh, with the 5.9%, what is our average over 10 years of our increase? It's 2.39%. If we had the 8.55, that would put us at 2.64% with the average um, over the 10 years for the rate request. On the next slide, you can actually see it a little bit differently. 
um, and it shows you where we sit with the compounded average annual increase over the past 10 years, with Copley clearly being the low lowest and Northwestern in the second spot with our original um, submission of our budget. And there's that 2.64 that's sitting in there if there was an 8.55 to get us to a 1% margin. I think what's, um, it needs to be said about this particular graph and why we did this um, is because it's important to know that rate reductions are compounded year over year. They're sort of forever rate reductions, so to speak, multi-year. And so we're so far behind the rest of the group. If you take the next line, which is 4.19% of Brattleboro, as that being the average, our um, NPR would be higher by 19 million in this year. So we're continuing to lag behind, and our bottom line is really suffering with the impact of that compounding effect, the rate, the forever rate reduction. And lastly for me, I want to discuss um, how historical rate increases or rate decreases have affected prices. So as of today, NMC's prices are less than what they were in 2015. A procedure at NMC with a price of $1 in 2015, today is priced at 97 cents. And you can compare that with the average of our peers at $1.15. If approved for the 5.9% rate increase that we have requested, our price will be $1.03. And we can compare that to the average of our peers at $1.18. So not being approved um, for rate increases that we have requested or having a rate decrease on our organization has really meant that Northwestern has had to fund raises for our staff, inflation, um, and the investment in healthcare reform completely on its own um, and completely from its reserves. And we believe that we have been overcorrected. We have to stop drawing on our reserves. Um, they are appropriate and it's really time for NMC to transition back to making a sustainable margin. So we've reached our tipping point. There's no doubt you've held us accountable uh, for our, our work and our financial um, status. Our rates have been reduced and overcorrected. Our day's cash on hand have been drawn down because of our plans for investment, but also now for operations. We're cutting our expenses. You can see that and hopefully you can feel that in our work. We're going to be doing that with programs and services with our board leading us um, in, the, in the weeks ahead. We have been all in from day one uh, with the all pair waiver, uh, working with one care and actually for a bit we were the only one outside of the UBM Health Network that was partnering in that. We took the risk, we joined in early to learn, to grow, and to pave the way. There's complexity and cost in managing a population. We still have chronic conditions as we work greatly to prevent them from ever starting. But we have a bubble of chronic conditions to manage through um, in order for our efforts to keep people well to really um, begin to make a difference. Our pressures are jeopardizing our access to care as we think about the things we're no longer going to do, things that we're doing now that belong in a community setting. We employ almost 900 people. We know we're an engine in the economics of our community. We are committed to invest in prevention because it's the right thing to do. The traditional hospital of, of treating disease and incident must be transitioned to a system that's out in the community, keeping people well, high quality of life, reducing the cost of healthcare. We're committed to the transformation of healthcare, but our bottom line suggests we need to back away. We believe this budget is appropriate. It's transparent. You know everything about us and we'll answer anything that you might have, but this budget does require approval for us to continue forward. 
this has been a tough year for us. And you might say a tough three years, um, but particularly tough in the challenges that you're aware of and we reported on uh, a few months ago. And we've not wavered from our commitment to lead. We want the latitude uh, to continue to do that and to continue to be a leader uh, in the state of Vermont because our community, Franklin and Grand Isle, are entrusting their care to us. And as I drove down here this morning, as many of you did, we passed a very tragic accident on 89. And I know as we sit here and we talk about this budget, our hearts are with those individuals and the families in that devastating incident. When I arrived here and sat in my vehicle to collect my thoughts, I checked my text, and this popped up from the early morning lab staff that knew we were here, um, and they're rooting for us. And that's the reason our staff, our commitment to our staff, our commitment to our community, our medical staff, our volunteers that are there to provide exceptional care for our community, that gives us reason to be here and to have a conversation about our budget. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And before I turn it over to Member Holmes to uh, start the questioning, just want to say that very good presentation, and uh, Stephanie, you really nailed all the key points that we were looking at. <laughs> Thank you. You're a, a rising star. <laughs> she totally is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Jill and team, I definitely want to start with uh, an applause for your leadership, obviously, in a lot of the work that you do in wellness initiatives and population health. I know you're, you're a leader, you've always been a leader. Now you're a leader in cost savings and trying to find initiatives. I know it's really hard, and I've known you now for five years sitting here like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I can hear in your voice, these are challenging times, but I can hear in your voice a sense of urgency. So, uh, and the concerns you have, and the passion for your community, and the passion for trying to, to find a way forward. So I hear you. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about, you've talked about trying to invest in the right access in our community and redefining programs and services for financial sustainability. And I want to ask a bit more about that because I think it's an interesting times and I think we've heard that from some other hospitals, North Country is doing service line, you know, reevaluation. And um, so I want to hear a little bit about how you go about doing that. What are the factors? I mean, access is an important issue, probably the most important issue. We want to have access to services uh, in your community. How do you decide what are the types of services that should be in your community? What should be outsourced to larger centers? How much does uh, contribution to margin play in, in that decision? And how much does quality in terms of volume, can you get enough volume to support the quality that you want? How does that all work as you're rethinking this? Sure, let me tell you our process of, of getting to those decisions. So every three years, not unlike others, but we have a strategic planning uh, process that allows a quorum or consultants to come in and actually look at our demographics. So we have someone actually come in, look at our demographics, also look at it on a national perspective and what trends are and what's happening um, in the market, even with innovative opportunities in which to provide care. And we also interview stakeholders. Um, so they will go out and interview in groups, different, and we also have our medical staff, of course, and our, uh, our staff and our board leaders but also subsets, varying subsets of our community. And then we marry that up with a community health needs assessment, which really does drive so much of our conversations. So in that study for the demographics and looking at our population, they actually do uh, predictive um, analytics in what type of services we're going to need and how many providers that we're going to need in those particular categories. And actually, even with those predictions, we are conservative because we will we'll start something and then we will allow it to grow to see how it's actually going to fare. For example, uh, with our, our medical clinics, by the way, Amy Putnam's here, she leads the medical clinic. She works so closely with UVM Medical Center and, and others to figure out what are the right services because some of the services we can't provide full time. I mean, we started off this with wanting, you know, needing more primary care. Do we do it? Does the FQHC, whatever our private, so figuring out, we don't have to own it all. We just want to make sure that is accessible. So now it's some, somewhat about medical clinics and, so neurology, 
and negotiating, you know, what is it we need for a neuro neurologist um, available. So we start off like with one day, and because of the contract with UVM Medical Center and the flexibility, we can at now we're up to like a day and a half, and might we go to two. So it's a lot about prediction uh, and looking at our population, and then it's about starting it and not putting so much in it's harder to back away, but knowing um, the population um, and uh, doing it and, and easing in it, especially if you've got a partner. You mentioned partnerships earlier, I think that's um, really important. At the same time, we look at how care is being uh, delivered differently. Um, in these past several months, we made a decision to eliminate a service of interventional pain, and how might we do that differently? How might we have chronic pain management actually uh, back into primary care? There was a time when you pulled it out and you made it special, and now how are you moving it back into primary care? So it's really important to be having these conversations with providers, seeing what's going on, and making sure we understand what is uh, best practice. But ultimately, we look at a lot of things. We look at data, we look at our reality, we look at um, the community health needs assessment, um, and we bank a lot on um, what our community is telling us. Thank you. Um, tough times with Meditech. Sounds oh boy, like that boy. I will also <laughs> extend my sympathy on that. I was on the Porter board when they implemented Meditech, and I remember the, the growing pains and the suffering that that ensued. They got through it. And there's another side to it, but um, I'm trying to understand. Uh, the margin was obviously compromised by the Meditech. Is it was it productivity losses and revenue losses, or was it ex unexpected expenses that drove more of it? What was it? On which side of that? Well, it was certainly a little bit of both. But out of the gate, we had budgeted for uh, a transition. We knew the volumes would be lighter in that first four to six weeks, is what we had predicted, and so we had. Uh, booked um, our visits at about 50%. Okay. And what's happened is we haven't been able to bounce back. Some have, our specialists are coming uh, back to a, a higher volume, but our primary care and pediatrics are remaining soft. Now, even the ones that have gone back to their volumes, we're finding that they're having to do charting after hours, so there's still complexity even in the ones to simply say, oh yeah, they're back to their volumes. It's not without, um, uh, concerned for the, the hours that they're putting in to get back there. And there is some clearly some expenses going on in this budget uh, for con consultation um, and resources to be elbow to elbow with the providers so we can still see patients. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the provider burnout at the time. I am, we're really totally worried um, about that and we are having conversations daily with our our providers to be right there, but it is very tenuous. Yeah, I mean, I think, as Jill said, the only thing I would add is it has a revenue component and it has an expense component, so why are you not backing off of those revenues for FY20, because can you really get um, back up to your current um, visits per day by October 1st? And I think it would be too conservative for me to build in both the expense um, additions and the revenue reductions because the reason to bring on the additional FTEs is so that they can help get through some of that chart prep and some of that documentation that is slowing people down. So if we put these extra resources in place, that will allow those visits per day for those who are still struggling to get back up to their normal levels. So that was our thought process there. Got it. Um, this is a question I've been asking some of the other hospitals, and it actually relates to an HCA question around the ratio of commercial to Medicare reimbursements, and your answer in there was 1.3 to 1.46. So can I assume then, can I take that and say that if, the average, if on average Medicare pays $100 for a service, your commercial payers would reimburse you on average about $130 to $145? Yeah, you have to take commercials as a bucket, so there's, yeah, multiple of them. At the most, it is close to double, um, which is close to what you heard in the presentation before us. Um, and so once you average it all out, um, that's the number that we provided to you. And I would also agree with the Medicaid um, number that was out there earlier, somewhere around $70 to that $100. Ours is close to that as well. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, we've asked all the hospitals about total cost of care and resource use, and I just wanted to say, certainly when I looked at your numbers, you were exactly as you've shown on the graph, and low total cost of care and low resource use, so I want to applaud you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Robin. Wow. 
Do you want to go next? Either way. Do you want me to go next? Sure. Um, thank you, and thank you very much for answering our questions before we ask them. <laughs> As a result, I don't have a lot of questions, actually. Clearly, she's been spying. <laughs> I encourage spying. Um, just to follow up to um, quest Jess's question around the service line evaluation, as I think you know, I'm chairing the health, Rural Health Services Task Force, which is a legislative, cre legislatively created group looking at the sustainability of hospitals. Um, and one of the questions that I've been asking to the mostly the critical access hospitals who have been struggling is um, to expand on what kind of creativity or other operational changes you think we're gonna to need to be envisioning for the future as we move into a resource constrained, more resource constrained environment even than today um, while maintaining access. And you've spoken to that a little bit in response to Jess's question, but I just wanted to ask it in that context to see if you had anything else to add. You know, I think the, the biggest strategy, and not unlike others, is uh, telehealth for rural communities because, you know, instead of, uh, it's very hard to recruit um, to the rural setting, especially if you're the only provider providing that service because they like that connectivity um, and that cross coverage. So I would say telehealth is probably our largest strategy um, that we're expanding on. You know, getting into, I mentioned the ICU, that's a real issue for us. You know, can we solve that by telehealth, tele-ICU? So that would definitely be a piece. You know, we're having other conversations about what parts of care can be provided, maybe at UVM Medical Center. We do pre, pre and post things, and they kind of do the, kind of the bigger stuff in the middle. So we're having uh, those types of um, conversations as well. So, you know, we started with a theme of partnerships, and I know that the, our strategic plan is, is coming up, and our board chair being here is really about how do we leverage those partnerships um, locally because when you think about, um, I mentioned the Howard Center and the addiction, um, our addiction program, um, program coming together. You know, in time, once we do that, and I, you know, I don't mean to get out in front of my own team, but you know, does that become something that the Howard Center does? You know, are they better at it, and and we support them versus joint? I mean, these are things I think we have to have conversations about jointly. And or even you know primary care, we, we're just the best place for that. The most important thing is that the access is there, but it's going to be partnerships locally. You know, we're we're thinking about how do we monitor patients in the home, um, and we have home health. How do we partner with home health? So if we need to monitor and they're monitoring, how do we do that together? So it's local partnerships, um, integration of overhead. You know, even locally. And when I talked about the umbrella organization, again, we haven't done this only around benefits a little bit or even group purchasing we're all purchasing things um, and is there a way for our community to have benefit about uh, really integrating overhead services of IT and you know human resources and those are conversations that that we need to have and I think just like with small community hospitals the um, the small community organizations worry that because we're saying that that it all should come from the hospital and not necessarily, so how do we take the fear out of the conversation and really try to figure out what's right so that we, we all can thrive? And it doesn't mean that we're going to do it all and take it over. We actually, that's why we're thinking about an umbrella that's not the hospital. We call it something else, but how do we get this accountable communities for health that we're, we're so integrated in talking about, and how do we do that through a, a system locally? Because that's where capitation can be um, successful. I hope that helps a little bit more. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. I think you've definitely touched on some of the themes that are starting to emerge from the task force, including the telehealth and partnerships and uh, buy, don't build. All those have been themes that even in just our first couple of meetings have come through. Great, so, super. Uh, that makes sense. Great. That's actually the only question I have. Tom? Well, I, I'd like to join the chorus and say thank you for a great presentation. Um, there is you know, a lot of stress in these situations. Um, six, seven million dollar operating deficit is a bit scary, but uh, um, if, if you're targeting a $240,000 operating deficit for 2020, um, that's not too far removed from a couple million bucks, which gets, gets you to where you want to be. So uh, um, 
I, I think there's cause for optimism here because you seem to recognize your problem, embrace it, and, uh, and are tracking it down. Um, <clears throat> and like Jess, you know, people who go before you ask questions that you were going to ask, so I don't have to ha have to do that again. But on the uh, bad debt issue, um, I, I did note that uh, over the last three years, the bad debt has grown at a rate of 22% a year, and um, free care at a negative 8.1%. So that dynamic that, that you said you can't explain, um, but are going to work on with the health care advocate uh, yeah. just seems like fertile ground, because a $7 million bad debt uh, is, is a lot, uh, having grown from over four. But um, so, but I have, do have two remaining questions there. In your Bridges document, there was, um, in the expense uh, side, there was a collection expense at $369,000. And so I'm just wondering what that was, because that's, that's an up, that's a new expense. Yeah, um, so we, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, outsource um, that billing function um, and so we're kind of what you call like a first day out, um, goes to the collection agency for them to send our statements um, and do those collections. And then from there, if they do not, um, if they're not successful just by sending out the statement or doing that friendly reminder phone call, if they are not successful at a certain point in the collection process, then they actually move that onto a collection agency. So there's two different stops. Um, or two different places that collections can go within our organization. And so we were, there's a couple of things going on, but we were notified um, from our collection agency who used to handle both of those. So the, the items that were still good debt and they would handle the items that were considered bad debt and they let us know that they were not going to be providing those bad debt collection services anymore. And so we had to go out and find a different vendor. Um, so more than anything, that's what you're seeing there is just us having to change that process. Um, we've kind of dived into our bad debt expense a bit because it is high and we we're trying to understand, you know, what the differences are between um, us and our peers. And we know that, uh, you know, about half of what we are writing off um, in bad debt is for people who have commercial insurance and that would mean about half of them do not. And so I do feel like part of our issue is also just a classification, getting things into that right bucket. Um, and doing things to get people qualified for free care. When I listened uh, to Northeastern speak and they said, you know, we, we posted at all of our registration areas and um, we have a dedicated person who works with people um, to get them qualified and it's part of their admission packet and you know, it's posted on the website and I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm doing all of those things too, but obviously there's something that we could be doing um, more and so I'm excited to, to dive into that and figure out what that is. Uh, and I, I think that I, from your statement, I imply that you were here at this morning's session. Yeah, yes. um, so I, I won't repeat the whole thing, but um, the state does have a program called the Offset Program. And, um, you know, it, it's, it was there when I was finance commissioner in the 90s. It, uh, it raises quite a bit of money. Um, and it's served by human, you know, it's supported by or, or used by human service programs, state colleges, VSAC, VITA. And um, I, I would just think, given the situation you're in, it might be a helpful tool um, uh, to generate some revenue. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, it's, it's a well-established program. It, it, it has all sorts of appeal processes in it. Um, it's, it's, and I, um, so if the state were to offer to allow hospitals access to it at their own choice and placing whatever debt they wanted uh, you know, to it, it's just an annual cycle, would that be something you would be interested in, or do you think that uh, you're happy where you are and, and where you might be going with a healthcare advocate? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely something we would be interested in. So, of course, um, we'll do our work with the healthcare advocate first, and then we would look at you know the details of that program and you know the costs associated with it. Because if it can be a win-win or um, a benefit to our patients, but doesn't really cost Northwestern um, anything additional, then of course we would be um, open-minded to that option. Well, what I'll do is I'll send you the program regulations just so you know yeah, if sure. these things on the horizon, at least what it is, because it's, it's very clear. Yeah, thank um, you. My next question is, um, I was looking again at the ups and downs, and for Medicaid, there was a 
$600,000 down associated with utilization and a $1.2 million up associated with reimbursement and, and payer mix. And in the narrative, uh, um, your narrative says that you're not assuming any increase in reimbursement rates for Medicaid except the, the amount associated with, uh, with one care, this five-tenths of one percent. And I'm, I'm just, uh, um, it, I'm just, it, so it, is, is that what five-tenths of one percent looks like on, 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 the, on the ACO rate, about 1.2 million? That seems high. We, I, that's definitely a detailed question. We can dig into. Okay. Uh, I mean, I worked with Mac last night. It's a big number. I thought this this doesn't. Uh, I'm missing something. So I yeah, thought. and I used to have to look at that one, and, and absolutely are happy to get back to you on it. Okay. Um, related to Medicaid reimbursements. We also have heard from a couple other hospitals and confirmed with Viva that there actually was a outpatient reimbursement change. Uh, I think it was July 1st to increase outpatient uh, Medicaid rates. So when you're looking at it, you might want to factor how that fits into. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the next item I had was uh, on bridges again. There was an indication of inflation increases at three tenths of a percent, while in the narrative there was an enumeration of inflation rates for supplies at two percent, surgical supplies and drugs at three percent, and four percent uh, for the cost of raw food. Um, so I'm just wondering what kind of you you know what inflation rate should we look to that we think you're looking to? Yeah, we can go back to that table and figure out if there were certain um, items within our expense budget where we are assuming zero, um, or if we, because of our cost reduction efforts, are actually anticipating you know some sort of a negative in that area. Um, I think we have spoken to specific items, and then when we roll it up together, um, it's just creating a different answer. So we can provide that detail. Okay. And thanks. So my last area is um, having to do with the cost shift and. Uh, so I'm looking at a couple of items that are on the uh, on the income statement um, that are not related to each other, but they just happen to be on the income statement. One is uh, the provider tax, and the other is DISH. And if you look at kind of how they are trending in your budget, um, <clears throat> in 2017, uh, DISH was near six million dollars. I'm uh, sorry, the provider tax was near six million dollars, and DISH was uh, at 1.7. And for 2020, you're projecting a $7.3 million provider tax and a $934,000 um, dish receipt. So combined, um, uh, in 2020, these just these two moving apart are um, about a $2.2 million uh, hit to your bottom line. And I'm just wondering how much of a role um, uh, you folks play watching what goes on um, at the folks that control the provider tax, which are in the building and across the street from where we are. Um, do you, uh, um, are, 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 are you fully engaged with them in terms of saying, hey, this, uh, this uh, $2.2 million is, is the entire bottom line that we want. And you know, as we're out here working very hard, um, uh, that kind of money is being siphoned out of our, out of our income statement. So the answer is, is in a, a, a twofold. One is absolutely locally in getting together with our local legislators and providing that education and understanding of what, what is happening. But more collectively, for a collective impact, working with the hospital association and all of my peers to try to leverage that um, in our local conversations as well as our rolled up conversation. You know, it's, it's a tough one when you think about it and how are we going to eliminate the cost shift and how we move forward to capitation. How is this all going to hold in? I mean, this is a huge issue. When you talk about getting together and aligning incentives and, and prioritizing, we have to be able to uh, to talk through this. But those are the ways that we're working on it. I, I can't tell you we're having huge success, but I think it's we're keeping it on the table, we're keeping it relevant in the bigger scheme of how we're gonna transform this delivery system with a matching payment system. So let me, let me close with this. It's not so much a question. Kind of a statement. I've been here, you know, for about a year and a half now, and um, kind of watching things flow by. And in terms of the cost shift, I'm just looking 
with this the hat on that I have now at some opportunities that um, may that 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 that, uh, that 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 could that that could be helpful. One, for example, just little things. I noticed that the auditor came out with the report um, on Dr. Dinosaur and the fact that there were folks that um, uh, uh, you know were, that the, the Vermont Health Connect system was not tuned up enough to collect premiums and not make payments. And so there was, just on a sample of about 257 households, there was a $2.4 million opportunity there, which they said, once Vermont Health Connect gets further fixed, you know, that will be cash. So I'm sitting there going, well, there's $2.4 million. Um, the, um, you have the, uh, um, Last year, just about this time, at the end of the, the state's fiscal 2018 to 2019, there was uh, $78 million transferred into the Human Services Caseload Reserve, and that was from the reconciliation of all the accounts, by and large, in Vermont Health Connect. And that reserve went from $22 million up to $100 million. So mm -hmm. I'm big on reserves in the state budget, um, but I but all of that money was generated, that new money from out of the Medicaid appropriations that were finally reconciled, and I'm sitting there thinking, hmm, what's the interest on that fund? You know, so you leave the fund alone, but what's the interest on that? Um, and that might, what, and might that be available to help um, uh, uh, with with Vermont hospitals? Um, I look at the fifty million dollar revenue increase uh, I mean, uh, at, the, at the at the close of, of, of the last fiscal year, fifty million dollars in revenues over target. I looked at the state budget. They did a very good job. The, the state budget, the transportation fund, and general fund grew at about a 2.8%. So, I mean, they're a big organization, very complex, um, and they did a good job. But, you know, there is our revenues that they did not expect um, uh, that came in. So I would just, you know, I'm just urging folks wearing some of my old hats is just make sure you're in the game because these opportunities come and, uh, um, and you've got a compelling story to tell. You're in, you're important organizations in every part of this state, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there are some opportunities to take this wind in your face and have it become a wind at your back in terms of uh, dealing with the cost shift. That's great, thank you. And then talking about alignment and really having these conversations together and understanding this arena, um, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, thanks. I also want to echo um, that you guys did a great job with your presentation and kind of addressing the questions we may have. And I won't even say that you were spying because I think you've handed in your presentation before you know, <laughs> we met with all the other hospitals. So I think you did a great yeah, job did. of addressing. Um, you know, I'm concerned about your hospital. You've had losses on the operating margin for the past four years. You know, and if not for the cash on hand that you've had and the ability to get some investment income on that cash, you know, we'd probably be in a much different place than you are now, you know, because you have been able to absorb that. Um, so a couple questions. The first one's kind of a loaded question here. Your, your last two slides, you talked about, you, you put on a higher insurance rate request on those, and you've just found out some news you're going to be worse off. Um, what are you asking us for? You know, because your budget request is the 5.9, you put on 8.5, and I don't know where we'll go with this, but just trying to get clarified. We're clearly asking for 5.9% um, and not to go lower. And I mean, and the consideration clearly about where you see us and where's the right time um, to invest, but we're asking for 5.9%, and we'd like to have that approved. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to page, oh. well first I'll talk a little bit about the ACO, um, and you've talked about the risk and the reserves, and just want to get a handle on um, of what you have on the P&L right now. So you're losing about $6.7 million, obviously, in 2019, and how much of that risk did you have to put up in 2019? Because you know, as a hospital that's in on all three payers, the percentage of risk you have to take on to your NPR is, is high. I mean, it's higher than most of the hospitals have to take on because they're either not in all payers or, you know, more people are getting service in their area. So just wanted to ask how much of that went into your 19, 6.6 .6 million loss. 
Yeah, so when we ended fiscal year 18, we had almost 1.7 million um, of risk reserve on our balance sheet. And so the fact that that has grown to nearly $3 million does mean that in the current year, we have had a negative P&L impact of just over a million dollars um, related to adjusting those risk reserves um, and getting them kind of where we needed to be um, as we head into this year end and into our audit um, and into next year as well. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and then for 20, you're not really increasing at all because you're taking that 3 million and saying we're gonna see where 18 finalizes at 19. Correct, yeah, I mean it's been, it's, it's very difficult. The, the folks at One Care have been incredibly um, good to work with and they're very responsive. And I know that there's just challenges around um, data and claims run out and um, the lag that's associated with all of it. So I know that 2018 is, you know, almost settled. I think they are awaiting um, some information from Medicare and um, we've been told that that's coming anytime now, um, but I don't expect any major surprises um, as it relates to 2018. 2019, we only have one quarter um, of data and we actually just received it really recently. Um, so I would love to say that, um, you know, we won't need 75% of our uh, maximum risk or um, that we could back that down or that if the program grows, I won't have to grow my risk reserve. Um, but I still think it's, it's early um, and the data coming to us is just early and, and does change um, quickly and significantly. And so we're just trying to um, you know, work closely with One Care, work closely with our auditors, make sure that we're covered, but not overly covered. I think um, we don't want to be in that situation where I've got, um, you know, a million dollars from two years ago and two million dollars from a year ago, and I got three million dollars this year, and you know, but those years are pretty much done and settled and gone, and so that I'm being um, overly conservative. So we're just trying to make sure we strike that balance. And I think you know the transparency that you're putting forward with launch it as it goes on, I think your position um, seems reasonable. Yeah, I know that um, if, if one care is able to um, bring on some self-insured plans uh, such as ours and is really able to grow that number of attributed lives and if we do get um, really into fiscal year 20 and it's looking like we're approaching 50% um, of people being in the capitated program, then of course we'll go back, we'll look at it. Um, figure out if those risk reserves need to be adjusted. But for now, I don't want to um, unnecessarily say that I have this liability that needs to increase. Um, I think we want to be um, as and we then, yeah, And then do you have the ability in your system to track um, for those patients who are attributed and who get their care you know, in your hospital with the kind of trailing or the tracking for the fee-for-service would be for those? Because that's obviously another risk or reward, if you will, you know, that would be running through. Yeah, yeah we are able to indicate um, within our uh, system who those people are, so we can individually flag them once we have our attribution lists. And for, I can follow up with you um, to give you a better answer to that question, but again, we just received um, an attribution list related to Blue Cross. Um, I know we're seven, eight months into the program year right now, which is 2019, but we just got that attribution list and so are working on pulling together exactly that information now, sort of that concept of shadow claims, how would we have done um, under fever service versus in this capitated environment. So um, we just got that data and we're really happy to follow up with you. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and then in your narrative, you had talked about kind of the Medicare write-off rates, uh, things related to 18 and 19, and I believe you also said is that's all resolved and is there a negative impact in 19 that's going through? Um, not a significant one. So we had worked really closely with One Care as we closed fiscal year 18 to work on this Medicare error um, in the formula when they made the capitation payment to us in the first place. Um, and there was an issue of some duplicated payments from Medicare going on. So there were a couple of different things happening. Um, but again, the folks at OneCare have been really good and we worked with them really closely when we closed fiscal year to 18 to make sure that we were covered. And so the ultimate bill or invoice, if you will, that we ended up um, getting for Medicare to sort of work through all of that and resolve those issues, it had a very small impact over on our PNL, less than $200,000 ended up flowing through our PL and we were talking about a number that was more than four million. Um, so we were adequately 
um, accounting for that as we headed, you know, went into this current year, which, thank goodness, because <laughs> that would have been more bad news. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, year after year, you guys have presented cost-saving programs that you put in, and I think you have, you know, a very good program. And just wanted to touch on a couple things. One, other, other things, other hospitals can maybe learn from programs that you're saving money. And two, um, you know, what alliance are you using one of the um, alliances with you to help get those cost savings, or how are you identifying them? Well, clearly, uh, our work with the uh, Quorum, we have a Quorum Management um, organization, and they provide, uh, through their contract, folks that actually come in and actually do assessments of all aspects of the organization. So that really helps us look at opportunities. Um, we quote, clearly have had education in, in lean strategies and we have an innovation team that has a diverse group. I think one of the opportunities as we're um, evolving as hospitals across the state is, you know, how do we have this conversation um, at the hospital association um, in order to how do we actually have the learnings from each other and I think we could might be able to do um, more of that. So um, the other thing I'll mention here under the ambulatory surgery, there's so much to talk about and is having um, Optum come in and really look at our ambulatory surgery central-like operations. So we do engage um, outside support and um, to look, have us take a look at our current systems and how we can involve them. So we have just finished that consultation and are implementing our ambulatory surgery central-like operations. And I, I really do wish this for all um, small community hospitals, I know that's what I advocated for through this whole process uh, because our world is changing in surgery and we need to be looking at that differently and how we deliver that care. So we engage uh, consultants and also um, different partners in looking at our strategies for cost um, containment. And were you able to quantify what the surgery center in Colchester, the impact of that might be on you? It's, it's really been, it's really early at this point. We do have a surgeon that has left. We do some of those surgeries can be absorbed by our our remaining uh, surgeons, but I don't think we've had an opportunity to qual quantify that because they really just opened their doors in, in June. So we have not seen a significant change as they are ramping up on what that means for us. But a year from now, or as we watch this play out, uh, we should have a better read on that. Okay. Um, and then in 2019, on your projection slide, where you're losing 6.7 million, I mean, it looks like kind of the perfect storm hit this year with a bunch of different things mm -hmm. impacting you. But when you talk, look at the whole Meditech, um, is there any recourse against, you know, the provide, you know, the, I guess the IT, right? You know, I know I've done implementations before, and sometimes when they're over budget and things like that, you know, there's a way to get some money back for them to give you concessions in the future, or? Are you talking about with Meditech and stuff? Yes, yeah, so, um, so yes, well, we're holding their payments, uh, for one thing, so that we have a little bit of negotiating power and some leverage um, in the conversation. And as I talked with the CEO just yesterday, to outline uh, the impacts that we're having on revenues and expenses. They are sending folks our way. They are giving us additional resources that we're quote, not paying for in the moment. But beyond that, there will be um, a reconciliation discussion of exactly what the impact is and how we're going to own this together. The changes that we're making are in Meditech some of these are significant to not only us as Meditech users, but other organizations that are going to benefit. So we are doing, we almost like have a little, our little testing center of their code that they're developing and where are their, their consultants. And we, I can see our little war room that we have right now that someone's in all the time to test um, this new code. So we will be having um, this negotiation and figuring out um, who owns what in this. Um, so right now we're trying to keep them focused um, and on the clinicians that need this code to be able to deliver the care that they want to deliver. Um, and that's certainly us, up to us as administrators to figure out how we're going to financially kind of battle this out. Um, that's all. Thank you. Is your IT system able to uh, track um, where your patients are coming from? We 
where they are coming from. I mean, we certainly have their demographic information, um, so we know what their home address is. Um, we are able to capture some things related to referral, um, so if we know they're coming from another practice or somewhere specific, then sometimes we can capture that information as well. Um, but if, you know, I, I was here earlier for the conversation about um, crossing state lines and how would you go about getting that data and, and I, I would agree that it, it can be really difficult and it can be tricky. Um, I don't know if that answers your question but those are a couple of the ways. Yeah I was just curious based on that it. conversation uh, you know you're also close to Canada and I was curious you know how much traffic you're seeing there and if you're seeing the same thing where they're um, actually paying you um, pretty much the same as commercial reimbursement. Yeah, it's the reimbursement is not bad, um, so I will agree with that as well. Um, and we anecdotally, um, I'm not sure I would be able to produce um, real hard and fast uh, data or reports either. Anecdotally, um, you know, I can tell you earlier this year we had a couple reach out to us because um, they wanted to have their baby in the United States, and so. Um, they wanted to pay cash for that service and had researched us and wanted to come to our family birth center And so I think you are starting to see just that overall whether it's Canada or New Hampshire or whatever it may be um, just that higher level of um, Consumerism right and where we get our services and so people are, are, t are paying attention and are looking at that So they had seen what our prices were and what our you know quality and outcomes were and had reached out to us for that so um, we were able to, you know, give them a cash price and, and go ahead and provide that service. And so it makes me start thinking how what other cash, you know, services can we offer and what else can we do? Because um, I think as much business as we are able to draw from that area, we should. And what about across the pond? Are you kind of static with your New York business or? Yeah, we are. We have not seen uh, growth in that. Okay, great. That's the only questions I had. Um, staff? No further questions. Great presentation. Can I ask one question? It'll be very quick. Go ahead, Susan. Um, so earlier in the week, I had um, asked one of the hospitals about um, diversity and leadership. Mm -hmm. And I had pointed out that in recent studies, you look at um, the decision made, the healthcare decisions are made by 80%, 80% of the time are made by women. 65% of the healthcare workforce are women, but only 30% of the C-suites of healthcare companies and hospitals and payers are women, and only 13% of CEOs are, are women. We obviously have one of our two CEOs in Vermont before us today, and I, I thought um, I, if you could share, Jill, your philosophy around diversity not only with women, um, LGBTQ, or um, any any of that um, work that you've done on diversity, because it's pretty impressive to see three women presenting to us today. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, I think it is really about balance and and really qualifications. I think that's first and foremost. I know, I know. Um, it's dominated by males, you know, as far as CEOs and C-suite, I do, I do understand that, but I, but I always feel that, you know, it's really about um, those qualifications, and I do look at diversity, I have a, an ear to it and an eye to it, I, I think more about, you know, our staff and making sure we're making the right accommodations for our staff, and I, and I know Jonathan's in the room, and I, I can't think of the organization off the top of my head, but but working with them to make sure that if folks want to transition um, their work and they may have some level of handicap and how we're accommodating folks in, in various ways. And I'm so pleased like with the Working Bridges program from the United Way because I remember being on a panel for that and now our organization is a part of it where it's really helping um, individuals get the skills that they need, build the confidence, and also like transportation, talk about social determinants in building the confidence and, and, and helping them seek um, you know, entry level jobs and, and giving people seven, second chances uh, or third chances and, and wrapping around them with the resources. So I think it's very important um, to look at diversity. I can't tell you that we talk a lot about it, but I can tell you that we practice it. 
and it's just innate to, to who we are. You know, and the fact that we're sitting here, um, you know, as, as women and two others um, in the room, and maybe the women have now tipped the scale in our leadership team, it's really about skill and expertise, and it's about fit. And I am so fortunate to be working with an amazing team that really embraces learning and growth across the organization for all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, Julia and Mike. Thank you. Um, so, and uh, thank you for um, for being me to the punchline. I appreciate uh, your recognition of uh, some work to do, and um, I don't need to be a dead person. Um, I, um, uh, I did sort of raise that question of uh, Northeastern this morning about what are they doing uh, well. Yes. Uh, just for your information, I also raised that same point with Rutland uh, earlier okay. in the week and plan to with CDMC on Monday because uh, those are the three hospitals that are sort of on that side of Great. Um, having uh, better Super. or equal free care. Um, and, then I, and then I also just, I do want to say um, well, so, and I look forward to meeting with you and, and thinking through both about your, your free care uh, program, uh, but also to um, try and understand that I'm, honestly, I don't have an answer as to what it is, why there's such variation in those numbers. Um, and it might be that you're doing exactly the same things as one of these other hospitals and sure. seeing different results. So what we're happy to throw we'll it into it with you. Um, but I do also want to say that. Um, I have knowledge from my other role uh, at running a helpline that we do see in the bad debt numbers, and this is a little bit in response to some of the conversation about bad debt, um, of uh, people who are Medicaid eligible, but who for one fault or another in our funky systems end up in the bad debt category, um, or people who um, have commercial insurance, um, but because of an error here or there, they end up in the bad debt. So there, there are um, uh, there are mistakes in our complicated systems. Um, names that are too long for a hospital system to put them in, or something like that. Believe it or not, that leads somebody to be um, uh, find themselves in the wrong category and end up with bad debt. Um, uh, so I, that's it. So thank you for your invitation. We look forward to seeing. We look forward to it. We want to figure it out together. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just have one question um, about your narrative, actually. And um, so in your narrative, you stated that it was understood that the Green Mountain Care Board did not intend for the approved price increase to limit or restrict the ability of hospitals to negotiate more advantageous payment rates with payers when possible. Um, and you said that it's not the same as the rate increase, uh, which is restricted by the board. Budget order. And I was wondering if you could explain the distinction there and what you meant by that statement. <laughs> Would you mind just saying your name one more time? Uh, Devin Batchelder. Um, so the the order that we received from the Green Mountain Care Board is a rate increase that is um, applied to our pricing. Um, and so our overall average pricing is not allowed to change by more than that rate that's approved. The negotiated reimbursement rates are rates that can be, it's the payments we receive from our commercial payers that are not necessarily related to pricing. It's um, negotiating a different percent of charge discount or a higher or lower bundled payment on a particular procedure, um, which also can result in that patient revenue. Um, so it's certainly part of the regulation when it comes to the patient revenue cap, but it's not the same as the price increase in our budget order that, that we receive. Okay, so you could potentially see um, an increase that would exceed the cap even if, so you could see a, a, a rate increase that would exceed the cap even if your prices don't exceed the cap, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I mean there are a lot of things that affect your total net patient revenue in terms of dollars, and that's what the, the cap is related to. This is one of those variables, potentially. Okay, thank you. I think at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public for any comments. If you could, if you could uh, 
uh, stand up and state your name and direct your comments to the board. It's Friday afternoon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be a beautiful weekend. So uh, we thank you for uh, your presentation and uh, hopefully you will have an uneventful drive home. I know that was pretty dramatic this morning for a number of people. And so um, our thoughts are with anybody who was affected by that accident. So have a good weekend and thank you. Great, thank you for the opportunity. And again, I wanna thank everybody that's here in this organization and those that are, that are back there that are totally leaning in to get to a better place. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Can you post? <laughs> I heard that, Jeff. Gave <laughs> uh, Jeff, what are you? If you can make a six o'clock. Uh,